cool. Okay, let's get uh, started. So good uh, evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are in APAC. Uh, thanks for actually joining us for this uh, first uh, APAC uh, virtual meetup. The first one after the GrafanaCon line that we had a couple of weeks uh, ago. So we're going to be together for uh, 90 minutes of uh, pure Grafana content. Uh, and for that, we're going to have like a lot of uh, great uh, speakers and hosts for this, uh, this uh, session. A quick uh, intro with all the uh, speakers and hosts uh, for today. So first, I will introduce myself. Um, I'm Cyril. I'm looking after the solution engineering team for the uh, APAC uh, region. So if you have been in contact with Grafana in the last uh, 15 months, it's very likely that uh, we already spoke uh, together. Um, and then I will hand it over to next uh, speaker, Anthony. Hi everyone. So I'm uh, I'm Anthony, one of the uh, the co-founders and the CTO here at Grafana Labs. Uh, I'm based uh, in Perth, Western Australia. Um, so representing APAC, uh, and obviously you know it's really exciting to kind of be here today. So I've you know when we started the company, focused a lot on you know engineering and kind of building product, but these days uh, it's just kind of supporting our engineering teams. Uh, you know, helping us you know deliver great products to our, our you know users and community. Thanks, Anthony. And we also have like a guest uh, star today. So, Stephen. Hi there. My name is Stephen Townsend. I'm <laughs> a site reliability engineer at IAG. And uh, previously, I worked in the performance engineering space, and I, I talk a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Next is Marcus. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Marcus. I am a developer advocate here at Grafana. I'm calling in from Stockholm, Sweden. I work in the uh, plugin platform team here at Grafana, uh, where we build the, the, the whole platform that, that fuels the plugins uh, that you can run in Grafana. You will see much more about that in my talk. Uh, but specifically, I help the community to build their own plugins. Uh, so you'll see me in office hours on, on community events and, and the forums. Thanks, Marcus. Next, we have someone that I have the pleasure to work with every day, Devin. <laughs> Hi, my name is Devin Halperin. So I'm a solutions engineer here at Grafana based out of Singapore. Um, for all of you probably working in the greater Asia region, you've probably seen me before. So nice to be on. Next, we have uh, Jag. I would pretend to be Jag because I'm stuck on the plane on the way back from Melbourne to uh, Sydney. So Jag actually can't be with us uh, right now, but he's also part of the solution engineering team and is uh, based out of uh, Sydney uh, with myself. And next we have uh, Sean. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sean Moritz, I'm based out of Sydney, Australia, also a solutions engineer, um, background in application delivery, uh observing application delivery with grafana is great love the technology so i had to join the company um i'm a new guy here so be gentle <laughs> thanks sean uh great so the agenda for today uh is actually quite uh exciting and straightforward so first session is going to be like a a recap of the Grafana line that, as I said, we had like a couple of weeks ago by uh, Anthony. Then uh, we will have a nice talk from Stephen about uh, SLO, and we will uh, finish with uh, Marcus, who will actually present uh, why Grafana users love uh, the plugins. Uh, after that, we will have like a, a quiz that will be led by uh, Cheryl, our marketing director, and who is also uh, the person who organized this event for uh, you and we will finish by this uh, with the uh, ask me anything uh, session uh, so last uh, last slide uh, for me is just a quick overview of the meetup group that uh, we currently have so uh, as you can see we are building the community in australia and in singapore as well so we are getting uh, uh, some presence in uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Singapore. Uh, so please, um, if you want to actually keep uh, uh, being updated on all uh, 
the events that are happening and we're going to have a lot uh, in the next uh, coming months uh, feel free to uh, to uh, register and it's also like a great way to uh, reach out to uh, to uh, to us and now i hand it over to you anthony for the first uh, session um welcome everyone so um you know as i mentioned earlier i'm a uh... I'm Anthony, one of the uh, the co-founders, uh, and I'd like to just you know welcome you to you know this Grafana Online 2022 recap. Um, you know, being a, a local APAC resident myself, you know, living in Perth, you know, I'm really excited to have this opportunity, uh, you know, to give this kind of recap. Um, you know, we've got a lot of content, uh, you know, that was covered during the conference, uh, but I've only got a short amount of time here. So, you know, I'm going to do my best to cover, you know, as much of the week's content as possible, um, you know, but I really do encourage uh, everyone to, you know, check out the recorded sessions that are available online. So with that, uh, let's dive in. So, this is our, our eighth Grafanacon. Uh, you know, our first uh, one occurred back uh, in 2015. And, and while the mission and the goal of Grafanacon hasn't changed over the years, uh, the scale of them definitely has. Um, so this year's you know, Grafanacon line, uh, you know, featured more than 30 sessions from more than 50 presenters from around the world. Uh, the conference had over 17,000 uh, registered attendees. And now Grafanacons, you know, have always had really two kind of key goals, right? The first, you know, we really want to celebrate and highlight what's been happening in the Grafana community. Um, you know, it's always really humbling to see how Grafana is being used out in the wild, you know, how community members have used Grafana to solve, you know, real world problems. And the second, uh, you know, is Grafanacon is, is really a learning experience. You know, we want to hear from the community uh, and we want the community to kind of hear from us at, at Grafana Labs, talk about new products and features and share information about exciting things that we have planned for the future. So let's dive into the first one around community. Um, you know, so we kind of looked back, uh, looked over a kind of social media uh, and other forums to find kind of interesting use cases of Grafana. And, and often these are, are outside the IT operations metric space. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that we kind of covered, uh, you know, during the keynote during GrafanaCon, but uh, due to some time constraints here, I'm just going to, you know, cover two kind of really quick examples. So, um, you know, the first one here is, uh, you know, something that's, you know, really fantastic and kind of, you know, we really enjoy this at, at Grafana Labs where, um, you know, we'd love to see kind of Grafana uh, being used out in the wild. And so this example, uh, you know, was from NASA, uh, you know, for launching a rocket and it was really great to see, you know, Grafana mentioned, uh, you know, on the live Please verify stream. the range is recording so let's, uh, let's telemetry at this time. Yeah. Verified. Thank you, sir. And a reminder to all Astra personnel, control room, if you require RF data, be prepared to switch over your Grafana sources at liftoff. So there we have it. So really just amazing kind of hearing the launch controller, you know, telling the team, be prepared to switch your Grafana sources at liftoff. You know, we really find it, you know, it amazing just to see that Grafana is used for, for launching rockets into space. You know, we didn't realize that, you know, NASA was using Grafana, right? They're just an open source uh, part of the community, but it's, it's still amazing for us to be able to see that and see that Grafana, ha you know, can be so valuable. And so the other example we have here is, you know, kind of representing uh, APAC, our APAC neighbors, and so this example comes from, from Thailand. So this is a tweet from Southern IoT, uh, you know, and here they are using Grafana uh, you know, to monitor water uh, uh, you know, management throughout uh, Thailand. So they're using Grafana on a tablet, uh, you know, that's kind of connected uh, using, the, um, using the Helium network as they kind of travel around. Uh, and so again, this is just another really good use case of where we see uh, Grafana just kind of delivering value to people. All right, so now let's uh, let's have a look at what's new here at, at Grafana Labs. So, you know, a lot as the, you know has been happening over the last twelve months. Um, you know, certainly as a company and, and you know with our open source project as well. So, you know, we're up over I think we're over eight hundred employees now. You know, across more than forty countries. Um, you know, we have more than a million uh, instances across our um, our cloud and, and open source projects, uh, and we've got more than 10, 10 million users across our open source and, and cloud free tier uh, that are that are you know really kind of getting value out of our products, which we love to see. Um, you know, obviously there's a, a lot of work that goes into uh, you know making these projects uh, successful. Um, you know, and we obviously you know have a lot of you know engineering talent ourselves uh, that that you know we use to kind of drive these projects. You know, both our own projects as well as other parts of the of the ecosystem. But you know, we're not the only ones, right? We really enjoy you know being kind of inclusive and bringing in uh, outside um, you know contributors to kind of participate uh, in the development of our products. So um, you know, we've got some key stats there. But um, you know, I think the big you know highlight for us is that you know. 
yes, we, we, you know, we will continue and we really like, you know, driving these projects, you know, but we also want to make sure we, we bring in, uh, you know, the community to participate uh, and be involved in, uh, in the vision and, and the products that we're building. So let's have a look at some of our, our open source milestones. And as I go these, I go through these, you'll notice that uh, you know, each one, there's a, a GitHub uh, repository uh, on the slide. So you know, if you want to kind of poke around, you know, whether it's you know, getting into the source code, uh, you know, or you just want to be involved in the discussions you know, about these projects, you know, head over to GitHub, you know, participate, you know, be part of the, uh, uh, of the community and get involved in these projects. All right, so let's dive in. So the first one, obviously, is Grafana. So, you know, the Grafana community is huge. You know, there's, there's many things you can do with Grafana and our users keep finding new ways to use our software. You know, we have over 950,000, I think we're getting very close to a million of uh, active instances uh, of Grafana now. And, um, you know, this is really, you know, a big milestone for us. Um, you know, but a healthy open source community takes contributions of many sizes, you know, from many different people, uh, you know, from tiniest bug fixes, you know, to great new features, and from people making their first steps as developers all the way up to kind of distinguished engineers. Now, Grafana has more than 1,700 contributors, uh, and we have, you know, five contributors who don't, you know, uh, kind of core contributors who don't work for Grafana Labs, um, you know, but who participate in the, in the governing of the Grafana project. Um, over the last year, you know, we've gotten over 500 pull requests from the community uh, contributing to, a, to the Grafana project. Now, good open source software is, is really easily extensible. Uh, and so most of our open source contributions, you know, are through plugins, right? And, and you know, this is by design. We, we really kind of wanted to build that out just to make it much easier for our community to kind of extend and, and build on top of Grafana without having to make core changes into the, the project itself. And so one really kind of a especially cool project that we've seen over the year is, is the WebSockets plugin uh, that Mike uh, Shazzy's blogged about in April, you know, to really visualize real-time IoT data. Uh, and there's over a hundred plugins, uh, you know, in Grafana's Big Ten ecosystem, you know, providing integrations with open source and commercial data sources such as MongoDB and Splunk. And so we've also had Loki, right? And, and our next kind of big project, um, you know, a community project. So there's, uh, there are almost 100,000 instances of Loki out in the wild uh, you know, that we know about. Uh, and Loki has made you know, huge strides this year, including uh, you know, a simple uh, scalable deployment in 2.4, uh, you know, which is a microservices approach that makes it really easy to, to, to start small and scale Loki up to handle you know, terabytes of data per day or more. Um, Loki made three uh, you know, minor releases uh, throughout the year, uh, including uh, the 2.5 release that uh, came out in April, and, and you know, the projects received more than 500 um, you know, pull requests. Loki has also has two non-Grafana Labs maintainers. Uh, and a special thanks also uh, you know, to Red Hat for donating the Loki Kubernetes operator, which is now part of the, the main project. Um, now Tempo. So Tempo, you know, we made this first generally available release of Tempo last year, the last year's Grafana Online. Uh, and in the year since we've put out uh, four dot releases. Uh, there's you know, four and a half thousand instances in the wild that we know about, and we received more than a hundred pull requests over the last year, including one from Pedro Azrovia that added the entire Azure uh, backend support. Um, and a you know, PR from uh, Shela Aguala that which added a new start and parameters to reduce the number of blocks that Tempo scans it during queries. You know, so we're really kind of you know, really you know, thankful for these you know, contributions from the community. Now we introduced uh, Mimur this year, um, you know, and we already have two and a half thousand, uh, so two point one thousand stars on GitHub. Um, you know, Mimur is the most scalable, most performant open source time series database in the world, uh, and with Mimur you can scale to you know more than a billion active series uh, and keep growing. There was actually, I think, a presentation at Monitorama this week uh, around this topic. Uh, over a, you know our years of experience running and contributing to the Cortex project, you know, we learned many things about running uh, at massive scale, uh, and we can combine the best of, of what we build in Cortex, uh, as well as you know, some of the big features from our enterprise metrics offering uh, uh, into uh, this new open source project. So with the, the Mimo launch, you know, we open sourced you know, previously commercial only features, uh, particularly uh, notable was uh, you know, features around scalability and, and the ability to, to achieve kind of unlimited cardinality, um, you know, uh, both from, from a storage as well as uh, being able to support really high cardinality queries um, you know, through a, a new query engine. 
And so with the release of, uh, of MIMO, users uh, everywhere can put together the pieces of what we think is you know, the most powerful, most comprehensive, and, and most composable uh, open source observability stack. Uh, and we call it the LGTM stack. Loki for logs, Grafana for graphs or visualizations, Tempo for tracing, and MIMO for metrics, right? Logs, graphs, traces, and metrics, or Loki, Grafana, Tempo, and MIMO. And so this is really our kind of foundational uh, observability uh, uh, platform, um, but it doesn't just you know, stop there. There's more that we wanna keep doing. And so this is where we had, obviously, the big news that came out of Grafana Conline a few weeks ago uh, is that we've open sourced uh, Grafana On Call. Um, so Grafana On Call was launched uh, at Grafana Cloud, um, uh, launched, sorry, on Grafana Cloud late last year um, you know, to enable DevOps and site reliability engineers uh, to manage on-call rotations in the same place where they manage their other observability tools. Uh, monitoring incident response from this central view in Grafana helps you resolve incidents much faster. And there was a lot of excitement in the community about being able to integrate on-call scheduling and paging directly into Grafana. But not every organization could use our cloud-based solution, you know, due to security requirements, legal issues around data sensitivity, uh, limited connectivity, or other reasons. Uh, and so we felt, you know, we thought it was ready for users to run uh, on call themselves, you know, and be successful and be reliable. And, and so we've, we've open sourced it, um, you know, for self-managed uh, use and, and on-prem installations. So let's talk a little bit about some of the features. So, um, you know, with Grafana on call, you can notify the right people the right way. Um, you can, you know, consume alerts from multiple sources and deliver those alerts based on pre-configured rules, uh, you know, to, to one or, or many different destinations. You can define different escalation policies and you can deliver those alerts multiple ways depending on your needs. You know, with Grafana on call, we've, we've followed our big tent philosophy. You know, trying to be really inclusive of, of other, um, um, you know, uh, products and, and uh, projects in the in the community. Um, so with uh, on call, you can consume alerts from Zabbix, from Alert Manager, Grafana, Elastor Alert, or if none of those kind of suit your needs, you can build something custom with the webhook support. Um, on call supports you know alert storage. Uh, there's an on call scheduler based on iCal, uh, and you know your notifications can be delivered to Slack or Telegram, SMS, or through phone calls. Uh, and Grafana on call really you know specifically has an advanced Slack integration, you know, which allows engineers to deal. Uh, with alerts, even without opening the web interface. So for example, it's possible to leave uh, you know, resolution notes right in Slack. So Grafana on call is now available via download from GitHub, in addition to the Grafana uh, cloud uh, users, both on paid and plans and, uh, and on our generous free tier. So even if you, if you self-host the Grafana on call yourself, there's a few of the Grafana cloud features that might be interesting to you. So for example, you can use Grafana cloud as a gateway to send SMSs and phone calls, uh, and Grafana cloud can also be leveraged to monitor your on call installation via its heartbeat. But obviously, community is really important. Um, so if you've got you know, feedback or questions, you know, we really recommend head over to, uh, to the GitHub repo and, and hop into the discussions that are there and, and you know, be involved in the community. All right, so now looking at, uh, at Grafana and, and you know, diving into kind of the past, the present, and the future. So, you know, just to recap, last year we launched Grafana 8. You know, it was a really impactful release that saw a ton of new visualizations and performance updates, you know, some live streaming capabilities, and, uh, and new alerting system that unifies Grafana alerting with Prometheus alerting, uh, as well as some data source query caching and a few other things. Uh, and since the release of V8, we've you know, been continuously making uh, a lot of improvements you know, through five minor releases throughout the year. A big focus of these minor releases has been to continuously improve and refine the new alerting system, you know, focusing on making it much easier to migrate uh, and easier for, for users to, uh, to set up their alerts and use the system. Uh, a big core visualization that we added uh, and, and kind of refined throughout the year was the new geo map panel. Uh, this is a new core map panel that's replacing the old external world map panel that you could install. Uh, this new um, you know, panel supports all the features of the old, uh, but it's using our new data panel and, and option architecture. Uh, and so beyond uh, that supports, you know, many different map layers, you know, seen here, you can kind of customize it as well as uh, supporting uh, different data layers. So you can kind of stack uh, many different data layers on top of each other. And so here we're showing uh, both a heat map data layer uh, as well as a marker layer with a custom uh, plane icon. Uh, and so the marker color size and rotation can all be kind of linked to data fields. Uh, so you can you know, drive you know, dynamic uh, views within your dashboards. 
Another change we made was around uh, was to the, the time series panel. Uh, and so we've made some updates to allow a single series to change color based on its value. So this really helps you see uh, when, a, when a single series is kind of crossing certain boundaries. Um, you know, the color can either be fixed, uh, you know, um, or you can use uh, gradient uh, scales. So this is really helpful when you've got you know, a single series and you really want to kind of be able to visually see when certain boundaries are being crossed. We've also uh, you know, kind of extended uh, the kind of uh, dashboard kind of editing and panel editing to add visualization suggestions. Uh, so with this with this feature, Grafana, you know, we'll kind of inspect the, the query result, you know, have a look at the shape of the data, you kind of look at the number of fields, you know, the type of data being returned, and, and based on this, you know, provide um, some suggestions for, for different visualization options. Um, uh, and we'll kind of prioritize the, the suggestions based on what we think is the, the best fit for the data that you've got. So this really kind of helps, you know, certainly new users be able to build some really great dashboards and really kind of be able to dive into the data they have and, and gather the, the understanding that they want in, it in a nice visual way. Um, and so we also added uh, a, a new visualization panel, the candlestick um, panel. So uh, this came out of a, an internal hackathon project. Uh, and so this is you know, obviously really important for, for when you're kind of visualizing market data or financial data, you know, something that we're seeing more and more of our community uh, start, to, uh, start to do with Grafana. All right, and so after V8, um, you know, we formed a, a separate team focusing squarely on kind of plugin development and, and the Grafana developer community, as well as on the experience of installing and administering plugins. And so in 8.2, we, we uh, released the new integrated plugins catalog um, and made it kind of default. Uh, and so now you can use this to kind of explore plugins that are available and directly install them um, right from within the Grafana UI. And this team's also been working on new starter plugins and guides to make it easier for, for any of the, any new developer to quickly get started. And you know, obviously Marcus is here today to, to kind of talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and so based on some feedback uh, you know, from our customers, we also extended uh, our usage insights feature available in Grafana Enterprise. Uh, and so with the updates, uh, you can now have kind of usage logs and events uh, streamed out to, uh, to a Loki install. Uh, and then from there, you can kind of build out some really great uh, you know, dashboards and visualizations that really help uh, you understand how, how your Grafana is being used and, and seeing, you know, helping you kind of track down problematic dashboards or data sources and, and get a really good understanding of, of what your users are doing with, the, with your Grafana instance. And we found this has you know, been really highly demanded from, from our, our customers especially when they have very large deployments of Grafana with lots of users and lots of dashboards. Now, the story of V9, you know, is really the kind of culmination of, of what's been, uh, been done since V8. Um, you know, in Grafana Labs, we really believe in incremental and continuous improvement. Uh, so rather than, you know, holding features, you know, for big bang releases, we want to continuously deliver features and improvements to the Grafana community and Grafana Cloud. So this means that really big features can drop on minor releases, uh, you know, usually first behind uh, feature toggles, uh, and then after some kind of feedback and, and refinement, uh, we'll make them generally available. So this brings us into Grafana 9. So, you know, we had some big kind of themes that we focus on uh, for this latest release of Grafana. Um, you know, one of them is around kind of discovering data, um, you know, making it easier for users to find things within Grafana, making it easier for users to, to query their data with improvements to the, the Prometheus and Loki query builders, uh, you know, panel searches, um, you know, improvements to, to a few other kind of plugins. Uh, we also focus around securing your data. Obviously, there's a, a big feature of, for our enterprise customers with the uh, general availability of our new role-based access control. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work around encryption just to making uh, the way we, we secure customers' data, um, you know, uh, some improvements there and, and using some more modern approaches. Uh, and then how you act on your data. Um, you know, so obviously a big uh, area of focus around is, is the alerting piece um, with both the unified alerting as well as uh, Grafana on-call. Uh, and then there's a few other kind of features that we've, we've also supported such as embedding uh, images and, and multiple dashboards into our enterprise reporting feature. So obviously there's a lot that, that's, uh, that's gone into Grafana 9 and I can't cover that all today. So uh, definitely check out the, the deep dive uh, in Grafana 9 that was presented uh, at GrafanaCon uh, and there's the, the link that you can jump straight to it. But a couple of things that I really want to highlight, um, you know, that, that really kind of stand out as, as major improvements is, is one is the Loki and Prometheus query builders. Um, so we've put a lot of work into this, you know, project uh, driven by Torkoal uh, to, you know, 
give us a, a visual query builder um, rather than, than you know, requiring users to learn PromQL. Uh, and you know, it's a kind of a steep learning curve. And so the new query builder, you know, visual based, users can get access, can build queries and, and gather the insights that they need without needing to, uh, to go and uh, learn PromQL first. Another big feature is our new heat map panel. So we're seeing more and more use cases of, of users uh, wanting to display you know, a huge number of series or huge number of data points uh, you know, from their queries and you know, the existing kind of visualizations would just kind of grind your browser to a halt. So we've done a lot of work with the new heat map panel to be able to give you some great uh, options to be able to visualize these kind of high cardinality uh, data that you might be querying. De definitely recommend you go and uh, try it out. Um, obviously the easiest way to, to get started if you don't have a Grafana already is, is on Grafana Cloud. Um, you can just sign up for our free tier and, and just get started and, and start using it and, and kind of explore all the capabilities that we have. So, Obviously, there's been a, a lot that we've been working on for Grafana over, over the years. It's been you know, nine years since the project was started, and there's a, a lot of, of, of you know, improvements and, and great new features that were delivered, but it's obviously not, uh, not the end of the roadmap, and we've got a lot more work and a lot of exciting things that we want to work on. And so, you know, one of the things that you know, we're really kind of excited about and kind of exploring and something that's you know, very close to kind of uh, you know, you know, talk with is, you know, he's dreamed about for a very long time, and we've talked about it for a long time, is it's kind of improving uh, the dynamic dashboard experience. So, you know, we're really kind of working on some ideas and, and working on some, some changes to, to really kind of make dashboards a lot more flexible and dynamic, uh, you know, giving flexible layouts, layouts that can support conditional panels, you know, repeating panels based on query results, um, you know, support for nesting dashboards and drill down actions that can open, uh, you know, unaggregated views without having to go to another dashboard. So really just, you know, giving a lot of, uh, you know, flexibility and, and dynamic control to, to the dashboard experience. And so we're really excited to, to be a point where we can start exploring some of these really fundamental improvements uh, and really kind of level up what you can do within Grafana. Um, the other you know, big area that we're focusing on is around accessibility and localization. Uh, obviously, we've got a growing community around the world, so we really want to kind of invest uh, in making Grafana work really well for everybody. And so we've got a lot of work uh, and a lot of teams that are working on this. Uh, and a lot of the kind of you know, big features and big improvements that, uh, that we're kind of you know, building into Kafana are kind of being brought about um, you know, from our internal hackathon. So you know, over the last eight months, we've had you know, three hackathons that we've run, and these are a week-long event uh, that's open to everyone in the organization, you know, to kind of bring you know, people across different teams, across different departments to kind of come together and, and form teams and, and project ideas and, and spend a week uh, you know, trying to you know, put something together and come and present it. And we've had, you know, we have on average about 130 plus, you know, uh, employees that participate for each one. And, and so far we've had 154 projects. And so from our most recent, um, uh, you know, hackathon um, was a, a project that came out of it that was really exciting called the Go Get It project. And so this is something that we we think is, is you know, truly, you know, a game changer for us, you know, for Grafana and something that we're really excited to be working on, uh, you know, this year. And it's, you know, this project really kind of envisioned, you know, a more um, simplified kind of storage solution for Grafana, where Grafana could store and read files directly from a range of storage mediums, such as local disk object storage, and, and most importantly, Git repositories. And so this would allow users to load dashboards directly from GitHub. Uh, and after making changes, they'd be able to, uh, you know, commit those changes via a pull request back into GitHub. And we really see this as being, you know, just a, a big kind of level up for Grafana. And we see a lot of, uh, you know, people in the community wanting to have more of this kind of GitOps workflow um, for their dashboard so that they can, you know, kind of maintain them over time. And so we're really excited to have teams. There's a lot of work that we need to do, um, but, you know, the, the proof of concept that we built was really exciting and, and just looks uh, amazing. And now we need to, you know, engage kind of engineering teams to make a lot of kind of big core changes, but it's something that we're really excited about. And we really feel this is going to level up um, some of the capabilities with Grafana. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's all uh, that I've got time for today, but it's been really exciting to kind of be able to present this. Uh, and, you know, thank you very much, you know, for, for everyone here who's been here. Obviously, you know, this is, this is what we want. We want to engage with our community. We want to hear from you all. Um, but with that, I'd like to kind of hand over now to, uh, to Stephen Townsend, uh, who's a site reliability engineer from IAG um, and the host of the, the YouTube channel, uh, Slight Reliability. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Anthony. I'll just share my screen. Let me just move this. Okay. Hi there. My name, as I mentioned before, uh, my name is Stephen. I live in New Zealand, and it was suggested to me that I might talk about service level objectives, SLOs, and how we've been attempting to apply them at IAG. 
Now, if you go online and you look up articles and videos relating to SLOs, you're probably going to be overwhelmed by glowing reports of how amazing they are and how everyone should be using them. And there'll be plenty of buzzwords, but very little detail about where to actually get started or how to make sense of it all within the unique context of your organization. So today, I'm going to share our warts and all journey so far at IAG into adopting SLOs and how truly challenging that has been but also what we've learned and gained along the way. Today's story has the following chapters. What are SLOs? Uh, then the SLO adoption workshop that we developed, how we pivoted to focusing on benchmarking of reliability, and some things which will impact how successful you might be when implementing SLOs. Now remember, this is just our experience. I don't claim to be an expert on SLO adoption. Service level objectives, SLOs, were developed by Google as a way to drive towards high reliability within their highly complex and massive scale environment. SLOs were built to drive towards a better customer outcome by focusing on making sure that our services are available and responsive to customers rather than getting lost in the myriad of technical metrics behind the scenes. SLOs are now reportedly being adopted by organizations all over the world. So to explain what an SLO is, I provided a fictional example based on a real world situation. So you start with a high level objective. For example, an organization might have a goal to reduce their operating costs by $10 million a year. And one way to do that is to increase how many customers use digital channels, web and mobile, because call center interactions are time consuming and have a lot of manual effort. So how do we convince more customers to use digital interactions? Well, providing a fantastic digital customer experience comes to mind. And within the context of reliability, providing a fast and responsive service is one aspect of that. So to know if we're heading in the right direction, we need some kind of measure or indicator. And I've given here the example of time to DOM interactive. And that's just a metric which tells us in the browser how long it takes between a customer clicking a button until they can proceed with the next thing. This is an indicator on whether or not our web page is fast and responsive, which ties in with our business objective. So we call these service level indicators or SLIs. A service level objective is a specific target we set for an SLI. So in this case, we're saying that each day we want the service to take two seconds or less 90% of the time. We track the SLO in production alongside our business goal, and we make continual adjustments. If, for example, we are not seeing an increase in digital uptake, then we may need to set a new objective. Maybe how fast and responsive the website is isn't a key factor. Or maybe it is the right thing, but we, we need to track a different indicator. Or maybe we need to set a more aggressive SLO. This Ongoing adjustment is what makes SLOs a culture shift away from traditional NFRs and ways of working. Okay, so 10 months ago, I joined this newly established SRE enablement team at IAG. And our job is to bring to life the goodness of SRE concepts to teams across the organization. If you haven't heard of IAG, it is Australasia's largest general insurance provider. And in Australia, it includes brands such as CGU and NRMA, um, and in New Zealand, brands like State and AMI. One of the first concepts that surfaced in this SRE team was that of service level objectives, SLOs. And we actually had a team asking to help, us, help them implement SLOs right in the beginning. SLOs were a brand new concept to that team. They were a brand new concept to all of IAG, and they were a brand new concept to us, the supposed experts. So we had to rapidly go and learn and make sense of all of this. I would say that IAG is a particularly challenging landscape to attempt this kind of work in, given the complexity of our technology, our structure, our culture. And my guess is that many organizations, especially large enterprises and government departments, would be in a similar position. It was honestly a pretty daunting task, but we put our best feet forward. We started by reading and learning. I read the Google SRE book cover to cover. I found articles and podcast episodes. I discussed SLOs with other SREs in the industry. I consumed as much knowledge as I could. 
And throughout all my research, I was actually pretty frustrated by the lack of real world examples or specific instructions. Everyone was saying, do SLOs without covering the how or even the why. There was a, a lot of celebration and not a lot of reality. I'm not sure where it came from, but we came up with this concept of a facilitated workshop that we could run with teams to identify SLOs together. I'm not gonna go into great detail on the workshop, but if you want to, you can check out the recordings from SLO Conf 22, where my colleague Gwen and I shared our experience running this workshop with a couple of teams. At a basic level, the workshop had the following flow. Firstly, identify the different customer groups for a particular application. Next, identify the key services that the team provides those customers. Next, benchmark the current reliability of those services to see where we are at today. Next, define high-level human readable objectives. For example, a fast and responsive web interface. Next, identify indicators which can help us measure those high-level objectives. And lastly, set specific SLOs for the indicators that we identified. You probably can't see anything here because of how zoomed out it is, but this is a screenshot of the original workshop, workshop template, which was absolutely enormous. Uh, we built it using Miro, which is an interactive whiteboard application where teams can collaborate in real time in a really visual way. And that was important for us because our teams are split across different countries and cities and mostly working from home. So I will say that Miro was the ideal tool for this kind of work, and I'll be using it or similar tools a lot more in the future. Unfortunately, despite the weeks and months of work we put into the workshop, it really provided very little tangible value. Even after hours of workshopping, we only identified a few SLOs and they just didn't feel connected to anything real. It felt like we were going through a ritual without actually working towards a desired outcome. So as a team, we took a step back and asked ourselves, what is it we're trying to achieve here? We decided we were really trying to help teams understand their customers better and to understand the impact of their technology changes on their customers. We also reflected on our team purpose, which we summarized as enabling happier customers and happier staff through the lens of reliability. So if SLO adoption wasn't providing those outcomes, then how might we achieve those outcomes in other ways? We decided to pivot and try something completely different. Rather than trying to specify SLOs up front, we would just go in and benchmark a team's current reliability. And through this, we were able to go in and deliver immediate value and not get stuck in conversations that don't go anywhere. We looked at a number of different lenses, originally based on Google's four golden signals, which we expanded on. And we also included a, a customer conversion rate. One additional lens I've been thinking about is whether we can measure how much toil, you know, manual, tedious, repetitive work that a team is doing, but that's a, a still a thought in progress. Through this manual analysis, we were able to pull together what I think were some pretty valuable and interesting insights. Two that stood out. The first was an extremely high number of JavaScript errors occurring in our customers' browsers. Roughly one in 10 times a customer clicked anything, a series of JavaScript errors would fire off in the background in their browser. The second really interesting finding was that there were approximately two P3 or P4 production incidents occurring every single day. And there were actually even more than that because uh, that were being missed by my ServiceNow filter. So what were all these incidents? And are there any patterns? How much effort is the team spending on a daily basis to remediate these incidents? By working with the team, we discovered that most of these incidents were actually caused by call center staff raising technical incidents for unexpected business rules. For example, a price not being returned due to a location being uninsurable. So there was both an education gap here in terms of what constitutes a technical incident, but also a lot of outdated documentation that needed to be fixed up because it was pointing people in the wrong direction. So you'll notice here that we just identified two major opportunities to improve our reliability without mentioning SLOs once. And if there's one thing I'd like you to take away today, it's this. The goal of SRE is not to do SLOs. 
It's not even to do SRE. It's to achieve great customer outcomes. And it really doesn't matter how you go about that. In fact, you really can't avoid leaning in to the unique complexity of your organization to come up with your own bespoke way to do that. The manual benchmarking process took me about a week, obtaining access, gathering data, uh, analyzing it, reporting. I also had to go to four different tools or places, Splunk, New Relic, Prometheus, and ServiceNow. So once we completed this first benchmark, it got our team thinking, how can we empower teams to track their own reliability over time? How can we automate or simplify this process? And that's when we started discussing the idea of a single pane of glass, a way to pull all of this reliability data into a single place. We engaged with Grafana Labs and started a proof of concept for Grafana Enterprises, uh, Grafana's enterprise plugins, which can connect to each of these tools natively. Here you can see a somewhat obscured view of our prototype dashboard. I've highlighted each panel to show where the data was coming from, you know, New Relic, Splunk, ServiceNow, or Prometheus. And at a glance, this is just another dashboard. But to me, what makes it valuable is the thought behind it. We identified the key things we wanted to know about this application, where to find the data, and now we've pulled it all together into a place that we can track it, share it, and discuss it moving forward. More recently, I've been pulled back into the world of SLO adoption, and I've been asked to help figure out how to apply SLOs in a very large and complex program of work. And while grappling with the complexity of the program, including the number of teams involved, the diverse technology, the team structure, I started to think whether or not there might be prerequisites that need to be in place for SLOs to succeed. For example, before we can even start, I think we need to understand the reliability and the performance of our services in production. This requires having sufficient observability in place to do that. If there are gaps in visibility, then when they need to be remedied. I think that's one of the benefits of adopting SLOs. It highlights gaps in your observability, which in itself drives towards better outcomes. Secondly, implementing SLOs is not just a cosmetic alteration. It's a culture change. It is a shift to embedding reliability and business objectives into the day-to-day -day work of each team. Teams need sufficient time and mental space to undergo that change. If they're constantly under the pump to deliver features or fight fires, they will not be able to effectively engage with the work. Related to the previous point, reliability and performance need to be valued. Are we here to deliver as many features as we can within a set of deadlines? Or are we here to create a great product that we can pin our future onto? Reliability and performance need to be as important as features, or they will be continually be the thing which is pushed back whenever there are delays in delivering those features. Teams also need ownership for the level of service that they provide and the autonomy to set and adjust their own objectives. This is fundamental to the concept of SLOs, to embed reliability within teams this requires program and other stakeholders to put trust in teams to deliver a high level of service. The moment external groups impose uh, a certain targets on teams, they lose ownership of their service and it becomes a box ticking exercise. Flowing on from that, in order for teams to operate with autonomy and to own their own SLOs, we need business and technology stakeholders embedded and working together within teams, not separate entities. This enables teams to independently make decisions about service level, among many other things. And lastly, I've touched on this already, but adopting SLOs is a culture change and it requires the right environment for it to succeed. Blameless culture and psychological safety are surprisingly two of the most talked about aspects of site reliability engineering. And it's been shown that these are key factors in whether teams are high performing or not. If we don't have trust, if people don't feel safe to speak up, we're going to fall into counterproductive patterns of behavior, such as a them and an us attitude between teams. And we can't afford that when working with SLOs. It needs to be collaborative, open-minded. We need to experiment together. So that's the story so far, almost. In fact, very recently, we've decided to push back on implementing SLOs in that large program of work and instead to start with a reliability benchmark again. We think this will provide better value faster and will ultimately help if we decide to adopt SLOs later. So what are the lessons? 
keeping in mind we've essentially failed <laughs> in SLO adoption, so I'm hardly qualified to give advice here. For one, SLOs in the real world are hard. They are awkward, they are messy, they require many people working together in a new and scary way. Just be aware of that before you start. Secondly, I don't think it matters whether you use SLOs or not. What matters is the customer outcome. In your unique situation, how can you make the lives of your customers, your teammates, your colleagues better through the lens of reliability? How can you creatively problem solve to make that happen? And if the concept of SLOs can help, use it. Thirdly, if you do want to adopt SLOs, start with the business objectives. Once you know what the organization wants to achieve, everything you do can flow on from that. This will give you focus and an immediate connection between business and technical stakeholders. Fourth, you need the right culture in place. Blameless culture where it's about finding a path forward rather than finding someone to blame. You will continually fail and how you respond to those failures will determine your success. This includes psychological safety and giving teams time and space to improve and innovate. If teams are always under the pump, they will end up drowning in a sea of technical debt. Fifth, to get the level of collaboration uh, required to implement SLOs, you really need leadership support. You'll need leadership to provide time and space and priority to teams to give them a chance to experiment with SLOs. You can't necessarily just convince everyone to adopt SLOs through persuasive presentations, especially if everyone is too busy to listen. And lastly, apply SLOs the way we apply anything else in modern software delivery. Don't take the waterfall approach of trying to plan everything out in advance. Instead, start small, try something, see how it goes. Learn from what works or does not work. Experiment together. Keep focused on the business outcomes and measure those as well. This is the only way to succeed within the massive complexity of modern organizations. So that's all I wanted to share today. And I hope you got something out of the session. Even if you disagree with our approach or ideas, that's just as valuable as seeing something you want to experiment with, in my opinion, because it helps you narrow in on your approach. If you want to stay connected, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn and Twitter. And um, as mentioned, I also host a podcast called Slight Reliability, where I share my journey learning about SRE from scratch. And I release episodes most weeks on Tuesday mornings. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. That was a great uh, presentation. Next, uh, we have Marcus. Thank you. Well, we've mentioned plugins several times now, and if you've never heard about plugins before this meetup, I'm sure you're, uh, you're very curious by now. Uh, don't worry, I will uh, walk you through what a plugin is and, and how you can use them. Uh, because, you know, certainly when, when I first started using Grafana, it definitely took me a while before I knew that you could extend it with plugins. Uh, I remember one day I logged in and I opened up one of our dashboards and there was this beautiful visualization there that I hadn't seen before. And so I remember asking a colleague at the time, you know, did we install a new version of Grafana or something? And he said, no, no, uh, I just installed a plugin. And so I, I immediately went to grafana.com and I started looking around through and, you know, what else was there basically. And I started playing around with it. Uh, back then, uh, to install a plugin meant that, you know, I had to, you know, log into the server, install the plugin from the command line, and then, you know, rest restart the server, which, um, you know, if you're just trying plugins out, that's, that's a, you know, that, that's a lot of instructions and, and, uh, it takes a while to, to try out several plugins. If you're curious, luckily, as you'll see today, there is a much easier way to try out and install plugins today. Uh, and there are many more plugins to choose from. So in, in this presentation, I hope to show you what plugins are, how you can get started, and how you can start browsing and installing them um, today. I'm also gonna show you a few plugins uh, so you can get a, a feeling for what, what's possible, what they can do. and. Uh, I'm going to go through a little uh, basics about plugins. So if you're already using plugins, uh, instead, I want you to uh, put in the chat your favorite ones. 
uh, which ones are you using right now? Which ones are, are providing value to, the, to you? So uh, plugins, uh, if you go to uh, grafana.com uh, and go to products, uh, and there is this link here to the plugins page. And here you can see all the plugins that are available to you. You can see that you can filter a few uh, here to the left. And you see that there are several types. Uh, and what these are is essentially uh, as extensions of Grafana. Plugins let you add functionality that isn't there to begin with out of the box. So when you install Grafana, these aren't really there. So you add them after the fact, which means that you can actually build your own and install it into Grafana without having to compile a Grafana from scratch. So there are uh, three main types of plugins. There are data sources, apps, and panels. So let's start with panels. They are uh, you know, visualizations, essentially. And they add new ways of visualizing uh, your data. So imagine that you're getting data from Splunk and you want to visualize it in a way that makes sense to you. And that's not supported out of the box. So you choose to install a new panel plugin. Uh, and it could be uh, new graphs, new charts, uh, new types of heat maps, and so on. Uh, data source plugins, they let you bring in data from other databases, services, uh, and other tools that uh, aren't supported by Grafana yet. So let's say that you're using a in-house service to get your, uh, your, your time series data, for example. You can create a custom integration to get that, in, uh, that data into Grafana. Or if you're using a database that's currently not supported by Grafana, there's still a high chance that you will find one in the plugin marketplace. App plugins are completely custom experiences inside of Grafana. They basically add a whole uh, separate section to Grafana and they're really cool. Um, we won't look at them today, but what you will be able to do with them is essentially add control panels, management UIs. Um, feel free to browse a few of them and see if uh, anyone uh, look, looks interesting to you. So like I said, you can browse all of them here. Uh, there are some plugins that are built by Grafana Labs and published here. There are some that are built by the community, by you. And there are some that are built by our partners here at, at Grafana Labs. You also have enterprise plugins that are built by the Grafana team. And these are available to you if you have an enterprise license. So there are several categories here. Uh, I will focus on community plugins today, but feel free to, uh, to browse, uh, browse them and uh, see if anyone uh, tickles your fancy. Awesome. So how do you install these plugins then? Well, uh, let's say we found a plugin here. I like this dark sky data source, which lets me bring in weather and forecast data into Grafana. Uh, I click this big button here that says install plugin. And I select the instance that I want to install it to. And I click install plugin. And when I do that, that will provision this plugin to my Grafana Cloud instance. And in a little bit, uh, that plugin will be available in your instance. So you might have to wait a little bit. Uh, and you can start using it. If you're using a local on-premise Grafana, you can use the, uh, the new in-app plugin catalog. So let, let me show you. If you go down here in Grafana over and hover over this cog icon and select plugins, you will come to this new uh, very beautiful uh, list of, of uh, plugins here. And right now it's only listing the installed ones, but if we click this button all here, then we can see all the plugins are, that are available on the marketplace. Uh, so for example, I can search for the same plugin here, uh, the dark sky one, I click it and I click install. 
And immediately that plugin will be downloaded, extracted into the plugin uh, directory, and uh, you can use it right away. And just as easily, I can uninstall it when I finish playing around with it, and easy as that. So that's how you install plugins. So next up, I wanted to show you a few plugins and different combinations of plugins that I think is really cool. So a lot of the plugins and the data sources that are available, they, they add more time series data uh, and visualize it, for example, with um, uh, graphs and, and charts and a number of different ways. Uh, but what I'm going to show you now is uh, some different ways you can use Grafana. So it's not necessarily only time series data, but as we can see here, I'm going to switch over to uh, the RSS plugin. There is a RSS Atom plugin available on the marketplace. And what it lets you do is that it takes an RSS feed and brings it inside Grafana. And as you can see here, uh, if I edit this query, you can see that I have this RSS Atom uh, plugin available here. And I can filter here if I want to look at items or, or channels here. So that is really cool. The only thing I did when I configured this plugin is that I added a new data source and I, I pasted the URL to my uh, RSS feed. And I immediately get this. But uh, this is data that might not be interesting to show in a table, for example. It might not be interesting to show in a time series chart, right? But it's still data that we might want to display somehow. So is there another way to do this? Well, we could uh, display this as uh, markdown, for example. But the problem with the built-in text panel is that it's only static content. Well, it turns out there is a, a, a plugin called the Dynamic Text Plugin. And uh, it will show up along with all the other visualizations. And if I select that one, first off, it won't show you anything. But what you can do is that you can scroll down here. And it works very much like the, uh, the text panel, where you can type markdown content here. But the, the cool thing with this plugin is that you can reference uh, fields inside your, uh, your query result. So here, for example, you can see that I have a field here called title, and I can reference that inside my content here. I can add, add things like the description. I can add uh, things like I want to read more. Um, using the link to that um, to that blog post. Now, if I, if I switch back, you can see that I now have this nice news feed, uh, completely custom made. And you can imagine using this for all uh, sorts of different things. Um, I know uh, some users are using it to as a kind of a service discovery uh, tool where they bring in information about the services that are running in their. Uh, microservice architecture with uh, descriptions and where to find them, uh, links to documentation and so on. And the nice thing is that we'll keep uh, updated uh, because it's uh, going out and fetching information from the actual um, up-to-date services. So that is uh, two plugins, the RSS plugin and the dynamic text plugin. Next up, like, let's look at JSON data. So I'm sure that somewhere in your architecture, you're, you're dealing with JSON. And a lot of APIs out there are returning JSON. So uh, in Grafana, there is limited support for it, but the JSON API uh, data source does add uh, a few nice features. So what I've done in this case is that I've taken a, let's see if I can open it up. I've taken an endpoint that returns information about the, the published plugins. So this is an endpoint that returns JSON data. So how can we visualize this? How can we start monitoring this endpoint? Well, typically you would have to build some kind of um, service that export this in a format that Grafana can 
can read, right? Or you put it into an, another database that is supported by Profano. Or you use the JSON, JSON API data source. So I have it selected here in my data source. The only thing I've done is that I copy pasted the endpoint to this, um, this uh, JSON uh, data. And what I can do here is I can add a field where I can extract information. So I can write something called a JSON path. This is the query language used to extract information from uh, JSON documents. So for example, I know that the data I want is under items. And as you can see, I'm, I'm getting audit completion here. I instantly see what data I have. Um, so let's say that I want to have the name of the plugins. Immediately, you, you've, you've had, you, you now have a field with all the names. I can do another field here that uh, shows you the downloads, for example, for each uh, plugin. And again, there's no you know, database here other than the one that Grafana has. It's just an endpoint serving JSON data. And we can immediately bring it into Grafana like this. And you can imagine you know, showing it like pie charts uh, or any other visualization that is uh, built in Grafana or a custom made one by the, the community. So actually, let's, let's change this a little bit. Let's see if we can get some time-based data. Let's see, um, let's look at when it was last updated. So now we can switch on the table view here and then we get some, some timestamps here. So what, do we, what kind of data structure do we know with a timestamp and a string value? Well, that is, that is a log, isn't it? So we can visualize this as a log. I can switch back to the table view. I believe uh, we should be able to. Uh, that's very interesting. But we can uh, visualize it with a calendar. A calendar is also a... Um, Oh, it's because uh, there is no data on, in that time period. But we can find something within the last seven days, for example. Uh, or we might have to go a little further. So the, 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 the calendar is a way to, you know, you can actually select ranges here. Um, and you can uh, apply the time range if you want to. Or as I did before, you can select a predefined range here. Uh, for some reason, the, the time steps aren't showing up here. Uh, let's see what I can do. I think I can select this time. If I do that, now they're showing up. So, so the type was, was not right. So here you can see that I'm using a uh, JSON API and I'm visualizing it in a calendar inside Grafana. So now we should also be able to visualize it as a log as well. Just uh, there we go. So all of these have been timestamps and you can, you can see them all laid out as a log. So you can see that uh, all these plugins, they, they, they collaborate and they, they fit into each other. They uh, communicate over this shared interface called a data frame. So you can really mix and match uh, from a one data source from the community with a visualization made by Grafana or vice versa, which is really cool. So one last uh, combination I wanted to show is the diagrams, um, the diagrams, diagrams plugin, which is using a, a syntax called Mermaid to build these beautiful diagrams inside of Grafana. But what's more, is that you can actually connect this to your time series data. Um, so for example, if I go down here, you can see down here, I'm gonna make it a little bigger. You can see here that I have some mermaid syntax here that defines a, um, a flow chart uh, from my order API to my billing API. And here, the these, strings, they actually refer to time series in the query result. So I can actually get them inside of uh, my panel here, updated every time I run the query. In this case, I'm actually running a, a another data source here 
called the static data source. And the static data source is really cool because it lets you mock data source responses. I use this a lot when I prototype new data sources or data uh, dashboards, I'm sorry. When I create new dashboards, for example, and I don't want to bother with configuring a, uh, a query at the moment, right? So then I use the static plugin to just generate the result that I want. And in this case, I know that I want some form of result that looks like it has a time uh, field and it has two number time series. So uh, here I can suddenly add another API. Let's call it the, the web API. I can give it a value, 50. And I can add this to my mermaid syntax here uh, and call it, let's, let's say it ties into the order API. And if I update here, you can see that uh, it ties into um, to the, the, the data that we're get, getting from the static data source. So that's really cool. And you can imagine using this with the JSON API data source or the RSS feed uh, anyway is possible really to combine these data sources and visualizations as you want. Um, there's really no end to what you can do. Uh, and so today I've shown you several different types of plugins that are available from the in-app plugin catalog. And as you can see, a lot of these aren't necessarily using time series data, but they still bring in a lot of interesting data that we can show together with our time series data that makes life easier for us. You can imagine using the calendar panel to, for maintenance, uh, maintenance calendar when you have downtime, when your deployments are due, uh, and so on. So I encourage you to uh, browse around uh, the available plugins and try out a few for yourself. And if you're interested in building your own, uh, feel free to uh, contact me or uh, even better, uh, read one of our uh, plugin tutorials for how to build a panel plugin or there is one on how to build da uh, data sources as well. So. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. So thanks to all the speakers for uh, the great uh, content. It was really, uh, really amazing. I think we were also like all uh, mind blown by the uh, Stephen skills with uh, Microsoft Paint. I think that you had a lot of comment, uh, Stephen, on, on, on that. So <laughs> sure, you can sell some of these slides as a NFT on the blockchain or, you know, yeah, that, that might be like a good, uh, good fit. Yeah, very briefly, uh, we talk about a lot the, uh, about the community and um, obviously when you're getting started with Grafana, with a different project, uh, it's a lot and it could be like overwhelming uh, the documentation is great, but sometimes it's not enough. So that's where actually the community become uh, a real uh, weapon. So uh, we have like a lot of uh, way to communicate uh, with us. Uh, we have like a Slack community workspace. We have like a forum. We are on Reddit. So we are on so many uh, channels. So it's very easy to reach out to us uh, to get some help to, uh, to, get, uh, to get started. As I said as well uh, previously, for the people who missed uh, the first uh, few slides, the first five minutes of the presentation, we also have like a lot of, uh, of uh, meetups uh, group available in the region, in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Singapore. We have also like a ANZ user group on LinkedIn that you can join. So if uh, Sherry, you can go to the next slide where the QR code are, that'd be great. Thank you. And yeah, so feel free to join like one of them. Uh, we're going to run a lot of uh, events uh, this year. We have a couple of uh, meetups uh, in person in Sydney coming, coming up soon. Uh, I think Singapore is also on the list. Uh, so yeah, so feel free to, uh, to, um, to join. And we are like very excited and looking forward to connecting with you uh, as, uh, as well. And uh, now uh, we have uh, 15 minutes uh, for the uh, Ask Me Anything uh, session. 
So this is uh, right now that you are actually supposed to post your question in the chat, or you can also like unmute yourself. So you have normally like a button to raise your hands in uh, your hand in Zoom. So you can use that and unmute yourself and ask any question. Otherwise, uh, uh, if you are too shy, you can obviously post that into the chat too. So uh, fire away, we are uh, we are here. Yes, so there is actually a question in the Q and A, just in relation to the uh, public preview of Grafana Go Get. Yeah, so I can I can answer that. So no, we don't have a public preview yet. So um, it was obviously a kind of proof of concept built internally. Um, there was actually a really great kind of video uh, around it that the team kind of presented, but uh, we need to kind of deal with some copyright things around some of the mm. uh, you know tracks and things in it before we can share it publicly but that's something that we definitely are, are working towards doing because it is it just looks amazing right it's really kind of exciting uh but we'll expect uh you know to be able to talk about this a lot more um you know throughout the year as we, as we make uh, more progress on it but uh, unfortunately there's, there's nothing uh that we can share right now cool. thanks uh thanks anthony we have actually a great uh question as a new grafana user what's the best way to learn i think that there is potentially like a million of answer to that question <laughs> no uh, there is not like two person who learn the same uh, way personally i love learning by just installing the product playing around um hitting some uh, roadblocks and then like uh, digging into the documentation but as i said there is like million of way to do it we have a lot of documentation tutorial available we have the the uh, grafana university as well uh that we open up like uh, very recently but we are publishing new content all the time uh maybe marcus or anthony you have also like uh, some uh, some guidance here uh, what's your preference for uh, for learning grafana today yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a, a hands on just get in and use it. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that you need to look for is, uh, you know, like, what problem are you trying to solve? Why is it that you're using Grafana, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, we see a huge amount of community and, you know, even internally people that are, are building their own uh, kind of uh, little telemetry systems at, in their own home, right, with some sensor data, maybe they're monitoring the temperature in different rooms around the house, or maybe they've got, uh, you know, whatever, some, some power equipment that they want to kind of monitor. And so like, kind of building those little kind of projects together, uh, you know, we find is a really great way uh, to, to kind of learn about, uh, you know, Grafana itself, plus the other kind of pieces in the ecosystem. So your metrics, logs, and kind of traces and storage. And it's a, it's a really kind of fun, exciting uh, thing to do. And like, you know, whether it's like a Raspberry Pi or, you know, some other kind of sensors kind of gather all this information uh, and then kind of pull all that data together into a Grafana dashboard. Yeah, I, I can I can just do a plus one on that. I, I also prefer to have, you know, a project in mind. So I'm not just opening Grafana and clicking around. Uh, while there are some resources out there, like the, the Grafana Fundamentals tutorial, uh, we do have a few webinars that walks you through the UI and what you can do uh, and how to go through, uh, go between logs and, and traces and metrics. Um, that kind of opens up uh, your, your um, what is possible with Grafana. But again, I, I really recommend that you have a, a something that you actually want to monitor because that will really uh, get you motivated and uh, seek the information that you need to, uh, um, to accomplish that. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that. And if you're looking for like good examples of you know different things that you could do, uh, also you can check out the play.grafana.net uh, uh, page, right? Which is kind of a public Grafana instance. There's a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of dashboards. We use that for kind of highlighting new features and new capabilities. So that's a good thing if you just kind of want to go and explore and see what's, what different things are possible in Grafana, uh, I'd recommend checking it out. Steven, you also uh, shared like a couple of links as well. In the chat. Yeah, as, as someone who's not from Grafana, yes, yeah, so I found um, the le learning from LinkedIn Learning and Pluralsight, the training courses, pretty good. I, I haven't specifically done the Grafana courses, but I've done the Prometheus courses, which cover Grafana as well, and they were great. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, there was a question around uh, building um, your own plugin. Uh, Marcus, you shared like a couple of links, but maybe you want to give more details. Yeah, sure. So I shared a link. Uh, I can see if I can share it again. We do have a uh, kind of an overview page in the documentation for 
how to build a plugin. You will find links to all the tutorials and some guides in there. Uh, I also highly recommend that you check out our, our um, community forum. Uh, there is a category there uh, for plugin development. I will send you a link to that one as well. There, are, there you will find other plugin developers who are uh, just like you trying to build a plugin. And um, yeah, feel free. Um, I, I really recommend the, the, uh, the tutorials. There is also a webinar uh, that we did earlier on building a panel plugin that if, you're, uh, if you pr prefer a more visual approach to learning. Um, so yeah, I, I think that those are, are great places to start. Yeah, some people are also like learning very well from the code itself. So you can also like check out some of the uh, plugins uh, that we have in our GitHub uh, repo and just trying to, uh, you know, like improve. And if actually the improvement could be useful to the community, you can even like push it that back to the to GitHub. So that's that's also like a way to uh, to contribute uh, to uh, to uh, to the plugin and learn uh, at uh, at the same time. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, one last link I'll share is because uh, you reminded me that we do have a repository of a bunch of uh, example um, code for plugins. So if you have a specific thing that you're looking to do, uh, check it out and see if uh, you find something similar. Thank you. Um, I think we have another question for you, uh, um, Marcus. I will just read it. Uh, plugins and security. What security consideration should I take into mind when evaluating a plugin? Same as web browsers, can a plugin steal data, mine crypto, or anything similar in that spirit? Yeah, th this is a very good question. Uh, so plugins are third-party code that you run in your browser. So obviously there is gonna be security considerations here. Uh, whenever someone wants to publish a plugin to grafana.com, they submit it to the Grafana team. We do a, a review. Uh, we check the source code uh, for things like tracking scripts, um, if you're not encrypting credentials or, and things like that. And so we, we do pr uh, provide a review of all the plugins and updates that uh, get submitted to uh, the marketplace. Uh, that being said, there's never, uh, you know, the, it basically come to, comes down to what are your demands on security? If you uh, really care about you know, security, I would recommend that you do an independent review of the plugin that you're looking to use. Uh, I would also recommend that you know, be, if you want to be safe, make sure that your firewall is configured uh, so that no data goes in or out without you knowing about it. But in general, we do review every new plugin and every updated plugin. Um, and I'll just add to that. So like certainly the community plugins, you know, always have an element of risk, um, you know, and if you're looking for the, you know, the safest option, uh, you know, go with uh, the uh, Grafana Labs created or partner created uh, ones because they have a much higher level of kind of vetting and, uh, and kind of oversight. Obviously, you know, the kind of projects we, we drive ourselves or with commercial partners that, that uh, you know, uh, work and kind of support these products. Um, and so they're always going to be, uh, you know, the safer ones. And, and certainly when it comes to, you know, kind of our products, right? Like they, they're the ones that kind of come with uh, the, uh, the commercial support offerings as well. Cool. Um, we have another question about, uh, yeah, share like info or demo link, how to set up SLOs in uh, Grafana. So uh, that's actually like a very common uh, question. Uh, I don't know how much we can share, Anthony, on, you know, like the roadmap for uh, SLO. Maybe you want to, get, to say like one of two words. I know that we have like also like a library that we use as well internally for that kind of purpose. So. Yeah, I mean, so it's definitely, a, you know, I mean, a common problem that everybody's facing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, facing ourselves. And when we find these common problems, you know, we obviously like to to build solutions, right, that we can kind of share with everybody. So that's certainly the case with SLOs. And, uh, you know, it's something that, that we do, uh, we are kind of thinking about and, and do have some teams, um, you know, putting some effort into and, and you can expect to, to see more of that uh, in future. But um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, 
plenty of documentation. I don't have anything specific, but um, you know, maybe I don't know if you, if you, Stephen, if you have anything, uh, you know, that you kind of linked. But uh, a lot of it's kind of dependent on you know the, the data sources and types of data that you have, um, you know, for how you are going about creating those. They they can be quite simple or they can be quite complex depending on your individual uh, mm -hmm. kind of environment in these cases. I'll, I'll add one. There's, there's some some features that we do have that do help make this a little bit easier. So. Um, like the continuous uh, queries or, or uh, recorded queries that we have can sometimes make this a little bit easier where you can kind of define a really kind of complex query uh, that uh, rather than trying to execute it, uh, you know, over really large time ranges that might be expensive, you can execute them over a small time range and kind of like record that value as a time series, right? So that you can build uh, a little bit kind of smarter insights uh, and, you know, build dashboards that uh, actually can load, right? And because certainly with like, you know, SLOs and, and uh, uh, SLRs, you want to kind of see like history over time, right? Like you want to kind of look back over a month or a quarter or such. And so, you know, sometimes very complex queries can make that uh, uh, cost prohibitive, you know, the, the backend data source may not like trying to pull that much data. Um, so there's definitely some, some features like the recorded queries we have that help make that a little bit easier. Thanks. Um... Yeah, Marcus, another question around a uh, plugin. Um, how Grafana plugin uh, plan to have like external API or plugin for external websites like WordPress in the future? Well, we certainly have already uh, support for several uh, different uh, services and websites and databases already. Uh, I don't believe we have from one for WordPress, uh, but if you're interested in that, uh, I'm not sure if WordPress have a, an API that you can connect to. I assume they have. I'm not that familiar with them. But if you do, uh, feel free to ch check out the, the tutorials on building a data source plugin and how you can integrate that into Grafana. So we don't have it to, uh, one specifically for WordPress today, but uh, I encourage you to, uh, to see if you can uh, integrate it. Yeah, and obviously you can also use like the generic uh, JSON data plugin that you used in your demo to call like any type of API, including the one for uh, WordPress. So that's also like um, something that you can really do uh, at the moment. Yeah, the, the JSON API data source is great for when you have a, a relatively simple uh, API or, or JSON response. Uh, I highly encourage you that, that if you find a data source that is specifically for your the service that you're looking to integrate with it, consider that instead because that is more likely going to offer you a more visual experience uh, you know rather than just uh, going through all the, the the entire JSON document to find the, the stuff that you want um, finding a plugin that actually does the thing that you want to uh, is probably going to be a better experience but the JSON API data source is there uh, as a last option. Thank you. So I guess we are running out of questions, but we are also like just two minutes away from the end of this uh, uh, virtual meetup, which means that we have done pretty well on the timing. <laughs> well, um, it's uh, 30 minutes past uh, the hour. Uh, I know it's a bit late for, for you, Stephen, as well, and for people in New Zealand who uh, actually joined uh, this uh, virtual meetup. That was actually... Uh, a great session. Thanks to Anthony, thanks to you, Marcus and Stephen, for uh, for the great talk and the rest of the panelists. Uh, hopefully, we will get to uh, to speak with uh, all these attendees uh, offline as well. So feel free to reach out, to reach out to us if you need uh, anything. Again, you have like all the link on your um, on your screen. Have a great rest of the day or the evening or the night for uh, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>